amen. I was supposed to put a plug in for ice cream. Homemade banana ice cream. Homemade strawberry ice cream. When I was, a, my family on my mom's side are all from Wisconsin, and they were dairy people. And I can remember my mom's mother passed away. I must have been about, oh, eight, nine years old. And we went to Wisconsin for the funeral. Well, it was in the dead of winter, Black River Falls, Wisconsin, way up there in the north. And we were staying at my cousin's house, and he said, you know, it sounds like we ought to have some homemade ice cream. And you know, a little kid, I thought, boy, that would be wonderful. Well, if we make it, will you crank the bucket? How many of you ever cranked the bucket? Well, they went out, and you really like this. They had the bulk tank, and they went out, and the bulk tank was off, and it had about two inches of cream on the top, and they just skimmed that cream off. And my cousin melted Hershey bars, and she had fresh frozen strawberries, and they didn't have ice. They had snow. Well, you know, you put salt on it so it keeps melting down. Well, I cranked, and I cranked, and I cranked, and I thought, I don't care if I ever have ice cream again. <laughs> but anyway, if any of you have a, an electric one, banana ice cream would be very much appreciated. Amen. Amen. All right, take your Bibles tonight. Let's turn to the book of John chapter 10, if you would. John chapter 10. We're going to look at verse number 7, and we're going to go down through verse number 10. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll start. So let's stand to our feet, if you would. And we'll read these verses and then we'll pray. In John chapter 10, verse number 7, the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. Notice this last part. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it what? More abundantly. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for midweek service. and We do pray what we're going to bring in the next few minutes would speak to each of our hearts and challenge us. And Lord, tonight, if there be one that's not saved, I pray you'd save that person or persons. And Lord, for those that are saved tonight, that maybe they're just not living for you the way they should. I pray tonight they'd examine themselves and, and make a difference, make a change in their life that they might be pleasing unto thee. Now, bless tonight as only you can, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to think that verse speaks about the topic of abundant life. When we get saved, he came to give us life, but not just life. I'm glad of that. I mean, lost people have life, amen? But the Christian life is much different, and it should be much different. Now, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. These are verses that we all know. But I want you to see not only the abundant life, He saved us to have the abundant life, but He also says this, that we might have a changed life. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5, in verse number 17, the Scripture says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. I often really, flags go up when somebody says they're saved, but they still have the same old lifestyle. Amen? I remember my wife and I got saved. I got saved on Saturday. She got saved on Sunday in 1975. And we had a good friend that was a, a jeweler. He was a diamond setter, one of the best diamond setters in America. And we got to know him real well. And he was an Italian fellow. You like our pastor. He loved food. Amen? And uh, on, the, on the Memorial Day weekend, he would have a barbecue. He sometimes would roast an entire steer. That's how many people would come or various different things. Well, I remember we had only been saved since February, and this would have been on Labor Day weekend. And we were there, and they were eating, and we were having a good time. Well, I remember a bunch of the guys, and these are all country guys, cowboys. They got out their guitars and all that stuff, and they started to play the old-fashioned country swing music. Well... My wife and I got up, we got out on that dance floor, and we started dancing, and I'm not joking, you can ask her, simultaneously we stopped, and we looked at each other and said, we shouldn't be doing this. Now you say, what's wrong with dancing? I told somebody tonight, it's all right to dance as long as you do it in your house with the blinds closed, amen? But where dancing takes you is where Christians ought not be. And I know this, there was a change in our life immediately. It didn't take forever. It happened immediately in our life. And nobody had ever taught us about that, but the Holy Spirit was working inside, and He was showing us that we were different than we used to be. 
But then it goes on, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Notice this, old things are what? Passed away. Uh, Brother Foster was the vice president of OBC when I was there. And I remember Brother Foster said this to me, because I had a pretty rough uh, background when I came to college. And he said, Brother Listen, the best advice I can give you, and you've heard me say this, as you go down this road of life and you cross the bridges in life, he said, you burn the bridges behind you and don't turn around and build them back. Hey, listen, we are different. The old things are passed away. And the rest of that verse, behold, all things are become what? New. And then I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going somewhere with this. We got the abundant life. That's what he died for, to give us life, but the abundant life in a changed life. Now, I want you to see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I believe this is a Christian checklist. I believe it's a checklist for our life, that abundant life and that new life. And I want you to look at it. We're going to go over these this two verses tonight, verse 1 and 2, and we're going to break them down. But verse number 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to ask this question. In fact, I want to ask you seven questions tonight. I wonder, are you and I living the victorious Christian life that Christ died for? And that's something that we need to think about, we need to consider, not just once in a while, we need to think about it all the time. And I think what's so sad about it is this, that not many Christians are living up to God's standard. And the, the abundant life is according to God's standard, not according to the world's standard, but according to God's standard. And what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to entitle this a self-evaluation. We need to evaluate our lives to make sure that we are living that abundant life that he died for and that we're living that changed life that he intended for us to live. And I think because many people are not living up to the standard of God, they're not experiencing the victory that really we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight I want to break these two verses down and look at them. And I want you to look first off at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And the first is this. I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I living an energetic life for the Lord Jesus Christ? Notice what it says there in verse number 1 of chapter 12. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And then what's those next words? And let us what? Run with patience the race that is set before us. Uh, you know, run not just after salvation and when we're all excited about being saved, but it's through the entire life that remains on this earth. And I think so many today, they get saved, they get excited, they're on fire. Boy, they're charging hell with that squirt gun thinking they could put the fire out. And about six, eight months, a year down the road, man, they back up and it's not the same way anymore. I want you to look also at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14. And I want you to see what Paul said. And Paul, without a, a doubt, was one of the greatest Christians that ever walked the face of the earth. And he had a bunch of baggage before he got saved too. But you know what? He did not let that baggage hinder him or hold him back from running for the Lord. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. When we get to the point we think we've arrived, we got problems in our life. And by the way, the older I get and the longer I read and study the Bible, I realize how little bit I know about this book and about our God. And I'll be honest with you, today more than ever before, I want to draw close to the Lord. I want to know more about our God and serve our God in these days. We've talked in recent days of the condition of America. Hey, listen, and what preacher preached last week, I mean about the end times and what's going to take place... It's right before our very eyes. How many here that have any gray hair on your head ever thought you'd see this happen? We never did. We never did. But it's, it's happening right before our very eyes. And we need to realize that we've not arrived yet. And we need to keep going forward for the Lord, running for God. And brother, it says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What does he say? Forgetting those things which are behind. We can live on the past laurels of our life. It won't do one thing for us today. We need to run for today. We need to run for tomorrow. We need to look ahead down the road of what we can do for the Lord. 
It says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You know what we all need to be? We need to be like the athletes in the Olympic Games when they run that 100-meter dash. Right down there is the finish line. You know what the finish line for us is? It's heaven. And we ought to be looking at that finish line, and we ought to be pressing forward and pressing forward. I said this, I think, a couple weeks ago. One of those runners in the 100 meters, he was ahead, but he didn't think he was going to cross the finish line first. And he lunged. He threw himself into the air and crossed that finish line. Why aren't Christians like that today? Why don't we run like the world runs and have the enthusiasm the world has? But then it goes on. It says, reaching forth unto those things which are before. And notice what he said. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What greater prize is there that you and I will receive other than the rewards for serving the Lord? There are none. And I think not many today are pressing spiritually uh, like they should. They're too satisfied with self. Uh, we get to that place of complacency. Complacency literally means that, self-satisfied. I'm satisfied where I'm at in my Christian walk. I'm satisfied with what I'm doing for the Lord. What? Listen, we ought to be asking God what He wants us to do. He wants us to keep running. Amen. We need to have area. We, you know, we get excited about other areas in our life. It's unfortunate we live in Missouri. Not that. I didn't mean that. It's unfortunate we live in Missouri and we have Kansas City Chief fanatics. Anybody in here Kansas City Chief fanatic? Whoa. <laughs> uh, how about Denver Broncos? Oh, I saw that hand in the very back. Denver Broncos, amen, the Denver Donkeys. And, uh, but everybody has got their team they like. And you know what? If my brother-in-law and my sister got to go to a, what do you call it, a tailgate party before they both died in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, to a Packers game. Boy, they were all excited about that. They said, everybody's hooting and hollering. You go to a game and you hear Christians that will go wild in a football game or a basketball game or some event. And then when they get to church, well, at least you laughed about it. Amen. That was a response. I mean, you know what? Our preacher, we have one of the greatest preachers in America. I believe that with all my heart. And when he's preaching, you oughtn't be sitting out there looking at the clock or looking to see what time it is. You ought to be saying amen. amen. You know what amen does? It's like sick him to a dog. It gets a preacher fired up. Amen. And you know, a lot of people, they have this excuse. I, I've had this lady when I was in Casper. I wasn't there very long, and she come walking by. She was a charter member of Lighthouse Baptist Church. She said, now, Pastor, I want you to know that you're not going to see much of me. I said, oh, really? Why is that? She said, I've been in the Sunday school classes. I've been in the junior church. She said, I've worked in all areas. And she said, I'm retiring. Now, I did, wasn't sharp enough then to say, give me chapter and verse on that because I thought about Moses and thought about all these guys in the Bible. When they retire, when the Lord took them out. But we need to run. Now, you say, well, I can't run like I used to. Well, that may be the case. That's all like old Ruth Giersey that we had in our church in Casper. Ruthie died at 92 and she would come to church every week, and she'd come in with her cane. She's kind of bent over. And I'd say, Ruthie, how are you doing today? She said, Preacher, I'm kicking along, just not too high. You know what? We can run. We may not run as fast as we once done, have done, but we still need to run. I think about our spiritual father, Harold Twiddell. Brother Twiddell died at 92 years old. You know what he did the night before he died? He, he called it, I went and preached to the kids. He went to the retirement home, and he preached to the seniors. Amen? He died with his Bible open and devotions. He never quit running, even at 92. He was, he was in the ministry almost 70 years. And I wonder tonight, are we as energetic for the Lord as we ought to be? Are we running the way we should? Hey, listen, this is not a, a sprint, the Christian life. It's a marathon, and we need to keep going and going. You say, well, I'm just too old. I know pastor could have said, well, I'm too old. I can't preach anymore. He didn't do that. Or many will say, well, I'm too young. I just can't get involved in the Lord's work. I got other things to do. You're making a mistake on both ends, whether you're young or old. Amen. Look over at Hebrews chapter 12 again, and let's look at verse 1. Not only should you ask yourself, am I as energetic in my life as I should be? But ask yourself, is your life an ordered life? And I believe that the Bible lays it out. It's an ordered life by God. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 again. And look down towards the bottom. It said, and let us run with patience. The what? 
race that is set before us. Uh, there's a lot of folks will say, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what, what I should be doing for the Lord. I remember a young lady that was in the, the girls' home. When I was in staff evangelist in Tennessee, we had a boys and a girls' home there. And I remember Jessica, mom probably remembers this. One night she'd, she'd graduated from the girls' home. She went to college for a year. She came back. She said, I'm not going back. She said, I just don't think I'm cut out for college. She said, but I don't know what I should do with my life. Well, I took her down through these verses that we're about to look at. Look at, at Psalm 37 and look at verse 23 through 20, 25. I want you to think about this. We, we already have the race set before us, and I think too many are wondering what to do or where to go when the Bible already describes it. Number one, uh, we need to live a life that is based on God's way according to His Word. Uh, Pastor mentioned this the other day of how many churches today, they're swaying from the Bible and they're swaying to the world and what the world is doing. We don't belong in the world. We may be here, but we are not part of the world. Look at Psalm 37 and look what the psalmist said in verse 23. It said, the steps of a good man are what? Ordered by the Lord. And the next part of this, and he what? Delighteth in his way. You say, well, where is that? It's the Word of God. The Word of God has everything we need. It will give us the direction. It will show us what way to go. But when we see it, you know what we need to do? We need to apply it in our life, and we need to do it. And delight in the fact that we can. Amen. Uh, look at what it says in verse 24. And it says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. How many people get tired of living for God and doing it God's way? And the next thing you know, they're struggling and they're backslidden. Amen. That's a fact. And it goes on, it says, but not utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And I like what the psalmist said. He said, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. By the way, I don't know of anybody that's starving today in our church. Don't know of anybody that is going without clothing, without a roof over their head. God will take care of us if we will let our life be ordered according to Him. Amen. Amen. And when in doubt, what do you do when you're in doubt? Anybody tell me? What's the old saying? When in doubt, don't. Just don't do it. Wait on the Lord. The Lord will show you. And, and I think about this. How many people base their life on feelings? You know, feelings will get you nowhere except in trouble in most cases. Look at Jeremiah 17, 9. We need to have a life that is not built on feelings, but on the fact of the Word of God. And Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 9, the Bible says, The heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. What's that last part? Who can what? Know it. We cannot base and order our life on our feelings. We have to base it, number one, on God's Word. But then look back over at chapter 12 of Romans and look at verse 1 and 2 again. And I want you to see to go on with this. Not only do we need to put God's, uh, God's way according to Scripture first, but then we need to put God's will secondly. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, I want you to notice down in verse number 2, it says, And be not conformed to what? The longer I'm alive and I, I see Christians, there are so many people that, have, that are stepping out and they're allowing the trends and the fashions and the things of the world to come into their life. That's not what God intended. If anything, what we ought to be doing is drawing f uh, way further away from the world and closer to the Lord and doing what pleases Him. But it goes on and it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be a what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and what's that next one perfect. perfect will of God you know I like that where it says up there present your body as a living sacrifice holy acceptable I told Jessica that day right there is the will of God for everybody not just for preachers not just for teachers it says present your body as a living sacrifice we are to give ourselves to God willingly uh, preachers shouldn't have to stand in the pulpit and pressure people to serve and live for God. And then it goes on and says a living sacrifice, holy. You know what that means? That means sanctified, set apart in purity for God's glory. 
I pray for our young people all the time that God would keep their hands on them, build a hedge about them, that they will not give up their purity to this world and stay pure for God's glory. Amen. Amen. And then I think it goes on acceptable. I like to do this. I haven't done it in a long time, but I'm going to do it. Let's imagine tonight that this door is closed and all of a sudden that door opens. But it's not me. It's the Lord Jesus. And he walks in and he said, are you acceptable tonight to me? Are you? And he goes through this building and he points at everybody in this room and says, right now as you're seated, are you acceptable to my standard? How would we respond? I got real quiet. That's something we need to think about. Because we need to be acceptable in His sight and not acceptable by the standards of the world, but acceptable by the scriptures that we hold in our hands. And you know who the greatest example of that is? It's the Lord Jesus. Amen. Look at Luke chapter 22 and verse 39 through verse 42. He set an example, and by the way, it says we are to be followers of Christ. The word follower means to be imitator. And you say it's impossible. No, it's not impossible with the Holy Spirit of God that guide and direct us if we'll listen and obey. Look at Luke 22 and verse 39. It says, And he came out, and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. I have no idea what was in that cup, but I'll guarantee it was something not good. I think what was in that cup was the sin of the entire world, and he had to bear it on his shoulders, and he knew the consequences of it. But he said, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But then the last words are the words we need to follow. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. I wonder tonight, is our life in order according to to what the Lord says and not the world. And then look back over at chapter 12 of Hebrews and look at verse 1. Here's another. Ask yourself this. Are you, are you, do you have a persevering life? Are you a person that goes on and perseveres and doesn't quit? Or you get discouraged and you fall by the wayside? I look out here tonight and I think of people that once were here faithful every service to tonight are very sporadic. Some don't come at all anymore. Listen, God didn't save us and give us that life, that abundant life that we'll just come and go as we please, but He wants us to get in. He wants us to run. He wants us to have our life ordered according to His Word and His will. Amen. But He wants us to persevere and go on. Look at verse number 1 again at the last part. It says, and let us run with, what's that word? Patience, the race that is set before us. That word patience literally means to persevere, to be steadfast, to be constant, or to endure. I wonder tonight, are we the persevering people that God wants? This is a self-evaluation. I've asked myself all these questions. And I wonder tonight, if you're willing to do it with yourself, say, Lord, examine me. Am I an energetic person? Is my life, am I running for you? Am I, is my life ordered according to Scripture and your will? Am I persevering? Am I continually going and not stopping? Look, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7. Paul had a lot of struggles after he got saved. Before he got saved, he was part of the group, and after he got saved, he was the enemy. But look there at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 7, and notice what he said there. He said, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And it said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. We may be down, we may be discouraged, we may be in a weakened state, but listen, it's the grace of God that will keep us going. It's sufficient for everything we need. When we're in our weakest state, if we rely on the Lord and we trust the Lord, we can be the strongest ever. Then it says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And it goes on, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. And I believe a lot of people think it was his eyes, and it might have been, but I think what is in verse number 10 was the problem. 
He said, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and the reproaches and necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I what? Strong. God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for everything. It allows us to go on when we have the desire to quit. I wonder tonight, ask yourself, am I energetic in my life still? Am I living that order life according to the Word of God and the will of God? Am I persevering even when things get hard and tough? But then look back at chapter 12 and look at verse number 2. We need to ask ourselves, do I have an upward focused life? What are you focused on today? Man, a lot of people are focused on the, the world situation. Uh, I still I haven't looked at the, the news. I think it's almost six months now. And I don't feel bad about it. Somebody said, did you hear what happened? No, what happened? <laughs> uh, if you listen to what's going on in the world, you know your focus is going to be taken off. You'll be thinking about this and you'll be fretting about this when there's so much to be done for the cause of Christ today. We need to be looking unto Jesus, not looking unto the world. Look at there at chapter 2 and look at verse, uh, the first part of verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'll tell you what, that verse right there, you ought to take it and get your concordance out and break it down and look at words. It's amazing. That word joy means uh, calm delight. My goodness. You mean he, was, he had a calm delight because he was going to the cross? Of course he did, because he was doing the will of the Father. And by the way, he was also paying the price that you and I couldn't pay. And then it goes on and says that was set before him, endured. Now, I thought about this. That word endure means to tarry behind. I, I probably, this has happened in battle. We got military guys in here. I wonder if over the course of wars, that there's ever been a man that said, fellas, I'll stay behind and cover. You get out of here. And he saved their life. I think about in the Civil War, the same thing. Uh, I wonder tonight if you ever thought about that. Jesus stayed behind, he, and, and he was on the cross. He never left it. Why? That you and I could walk free. Amen. I never saw that before. But we need to have an upward focus, and the reason is because of what he did. He went to that cross with a calm a joy in his heart. And he went, he stayed behind on purpose because if he had not stayed and endured on that cross, you and I would die and go to a devil's hell. Look also, if you would, at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. What a Savior we serve. Amen. Ask yourself tonight, am I living a life that has an upward focus, looking to him and thinking of him and honoring him? Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your what? Affections on things above, not on things on the earth. If the rapture took place tonight, I have absolutely no regrets and wouldn't stay for another second. I hope tonight that we have a focus that is focusing on the one who loved us, who gave himself for us, and you know, in so doing, we're going to conform to his image. That's what the Bible wants us to do, conform to the image of his son. And that means adults, that means young people as well. I wish our young people would get a grip on what Christ has really done for them. I wish they all would. You know who's tickled me to death? And that's little Cohen. Cohen got saved not long ago. Cohen came up. He said, I got saved. I asked Jesus to save me. He's all excited about what the Lord has done in his life. You know what I pray every day? I pray that Cohen's going to be the next preacher. You say, that's crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's little guys like that that get saved or excited about what they've got. Don't ever discourage them. Encourage them to keep their eyes looking up. Amen. I also think about our bus kids. I don't think we ought to have bus routes just to fill a bus. You know what my prayer is every day as I go through that bus list of those children that still ride our buses is that those children will ride that bus and they'll come with a desire to learn more about the Lord, to grow in the things of God, and that they will grow up and they will become mature Christians and have Christian families. 
That's what we ought to be praying. I mean, a lot of people look at bus children as, boy, they're, a, they're just a, a blight. They're nothing but a problem. No, they are souls that Jesus died for just like everybody else. And we ought to be praying that we can get those little, little folks focused on the things of the Lord and they'll live for Him from this day forward until He returns or we die and He takes us out. I wonder tonight, are we having a, a focus on the things that are up or are we focusing on things around? But here's another. Ask yourself, is my life a faith-based life? I wonder tonight, are we basing our lives on faith or are we basing on circumstances and everything else? Again, look at Hebrews chapter 12 and look at verse number 2. It says in the very first part, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the what? Author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Boy, he's the author and finisher. If he started it all, guess what he's going to do? He's going to finish it. And I wonder if he has the power to forgive our sins, he has the power to save us, he has the power to keep us until he takes us out. Why in the world don't we have faith day by day that God will take care of everything? And he will. I think about two words in that verse where it says, looking unto Jesus, the author, that means the chief leader and captain. I wonder tonight, is he the chief leader and captain in your life? He ought to be. And if he is, then our, our faith will be what it needs to be because it's in him. And then I think also of the word finisher. That word means completer or consummator. He's the one that started it, and he's the one that's going to finish it. And we need to put all our faith in him. Look at Ephes or Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, if you would. And again, this verse is speaking of that same thing of where our faith is, and it ought to be in Christ. It says in verse number 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath what? Begun a good work and you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That word right there, confident, means fully assured or positive. Faith that the Lord can keep us, that he can protect us, he can supply every need we have. And by the way, he will never fail you. The Lord has never failed one time. Not once. Not in my life. Not in yours if we're honest about it. But then I want you to See, uh, another thing here over in chapter 12 and verse 1. And I want you to notice and ask yourself this. I, do I live a sacrificial life? Sacrificial life. Uh, it says, lay aside not to cling to the things that hinder. Look there at verse number 1. Again, it says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us what? Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, the race that is set before us. You know that word aside, it's talking about casting off or putting away. And the word every literally means whatsoever. And I thought about this. Not everything is sin. Amen? There are things that are in our life that are not sin, but they're a weight. I know in my own life, the biggest weight I had when I ran from the call to preach was team roping. I, I insisted in my mind that one day I was going to be a national finals rodeo uh, com, com, competing and, and try to win a world championship. That caused me a lot of problems. It wasn't sin to be roping. It wasn't sin to enjoy horses. But what it was, it was a weight in my life that was dragging me down from doing what God wanted me to do. I don't know what it might be for you, but it might be a weight in your life. It might be something you enjoy. And it's sidetracking you from serving and living for God the way you should. You know what? We need to lay it aside. We need to be willing to sacrifice that which we enjoy if it's harming our relationship in the cause of Christ. But it's hard. People say, well, but you know, I don't do it that much. If it hinders you from serving God even that much, then it's a weight. And then also it says, and the sin which does so easily better set us. Hey, listen, you can have the little tiny sin you think is insignificant, but that sin separates you from God. It doesn't make any difference how big the sin is. If we have unconfessed sin in our life, the Lord does not even hear our prayers. And He won't use us the way He would if sin was confessed. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8, a sacrificial life. In verse 7 it says, In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but notice this, it says, but now ye also put off all these. These might be the hindrances in your life. It might be the sin in your life. 
It says anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Whatever it is, we need to set it aside. We need to get rid of it in our life. Whether it's the weight that is not sinful, but it's hindering us, it needs to go away. And if there's something in our life we know is sin, we need to confess it and forsake it. Get it out of our life. Because not only does it affect us, but you mark it down, it affects other people as well. I think about what Matthew Henry said about besetting sins. I want to read this. A besetting sin is a sin that habitually attends you attend in your life. In other words, you habitually are involved in it. Besetting sin, that sin to which we are most prone, whatever it may be, if left unsubdued, will hinder us from running the Christian race as it takes from us every motive for running and gives us power to every discouragement. That was Matthew Henry. You might be tonight, you say, I've got a besetting sin. You need to get it out of your life. You need to get any sin out of your life, all of it, that we can be a sacrificial people and run the race that God has. But then look again at chapter 12 and verse 1, and this is the last one. Ask yourself tonight, is my life an open and public life? You have a lot of folks that they say they're saved, but if you ask them about it, they'll say, you know, that's pretty personal. Or they'll go out or they're in a restaurant, they don't pray, well, you know, that's kind of something I do by myself. I wonder, is our life an open public life where the world can see it? You mark it down, people are watching. People are watching to see what we're doing and, and how we live our life because they know we say we're saved, we know we go to church, and they know all of that. But notice in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with a so great a cloud of witnesses, I, I used to think that was the saints from chapter 11 sitting up in heaven with their feet hanging over a cloud watching us. But you know what it was? It was their life. Their life was a witness forever the people to watch. And our lives are the same thing for the people around us today. But it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's why we lay aside the weight, the things that are not necessarily sin, but are hindering us, and the sin we know that's in our life, that we might be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 through 16, the famous verses, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before what? Men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Boy, when we live the life we're talking about, an energetic life, an ordered life, a persevering life where we never quit and we have that upward focus. People even know that. They know where our heart and our mind is and that we're faith-based in our lives and we're sacrificial. We are willing to get rid of those things that are, that are hindering us and that are wrong in our life and we're willing to be open and public. That's what God wants. And you ought to ask yourself tonight about every one of those seven things. Am I those things exactly as you mentioned tonight? I love to tell the story. I haven't told it in a while, so I'm going to tell it tonight about Ethel and Herman. How many ever heard Ethel and Herman? Just a few in here have. How many never heard of Ethel and Herman? Okay, well, there's some of you haven't. When we moved to Colorado in 1973, we bought 10 acres of ground, and we lived out about 25 miles east of Denver, and it was really a remote area. There was only two other, I think, three houses or four houses in the area where we were at, and when we built our house, it was before they had... Uh, telephone service in there. They didn't have natural gas. They, there was a lot of things. We had electricity. That was about it. But I remember that we had a neighbor that built a house. You came down an eighth mile lane, and then our driveway was a little long. You came up into our place. Well, Grover and Lucille lived up there on the main road, and they had a telephone. Well, it was amazing how that Lucille knew everything that went on in that community. She knew everything. Uh, we lived about an eighth of a mile away. Somebody would come in to visit. She'd call and say, Hey, who is that that just drove in from Illinois? You know how big Illinois is on a license plate? It's about that big. And then uh, she would call and she'd say, uh, or she'd, she'd, uh, she'd tell us when she, we'd see her next. She said, uh, you know, I noticed the other day the wind was blowing real hard. Your clothes blew off the clothesline. And I thought, wow, this woman, she knows everything that's going on. Well, then we finally got a telephone. Uh-huh. And it was a party line, too, by the way. That means you, you bring a ding a ding you got your own ring, and somebody answers it. Well, anyway, Lucille happened to know everything that was always going on. One day she called down, and she said, my wife, she said, Alex, you know, Billy's out there. He's running naked out in the yard. 
a little tiny kid, two and a half years old, but she could see that. And I said, we never had curtains on our bedroom window for two years. There's no telling. <laughs> Amen. But nevertheless, Lucille knew everything that was going on in that neighborhood. So I, we, had, we had this modern phone service that was buried cable. You know, that was supposed to be the ultimate. When the, blue, the wind blew, it didn't work. When it snowed, it didn't work. When it rained, it didn't work. So I would go up there to Lucille's house, and I would call the repair service. And one day I went up, and I said, Lucille, can I use the phone? Phone's not working. They had overhead lines. She said, yeah, you know where it's at. So I walked in, and there's a counter right here, and that was the kitchen. This was the dining area. There was a big sliding glass door right here that faced west. Well, I dialed the repair service, and you know, like normal, they put me on hold. So I'm on hold for a while. And uh, I'm standing there, and I'm looking around, and I thought, wow, what a view. You can see Quinby's. You can see Malberg's. You can see Shriver's, and you can see our house. Wow. I'm not the brightest light in the house. But I started to look around, and guess what was sitting on the counter right by the phone was a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars. And what old Lucille did, she would put those binoculars up against that sliding glass door, and she watched everything that went on in the house, in everybody's house. Amen. So I came up with Ethel and Herman. Ethel and Herman live in your neighborhood. Oh, oh, and I'm going to use the Brother Sox and his wife, Brother Richard and Miss Carol. Ethel and Herman live across the street from them. And they go over every Sunday, and Herman goes over and he cracks the blinds, and he watches the tutor's house. And Herman says, Ethel, you ain't going to believe this. He said, that guy wears all them crazy socks. Him and his wife, they're all gussied up, and they're all dressed up. They got in that car on Sunday morning about 9 o'clock. I don't have no clue where they're going. Well, anyway, oh, Herman finds out that the tutors went to Sunday school. And so he goes over there every morning at 9.30 and looks out the Ethel. There they are again. That guy wearing them crazy socks. He got that coat, and they're all gussied up, and they're, they're going over that faith, that faith thing over there, this faith thing. You know what it is. And so he starts watching, and then he noticed something on Sunday evening. Ethel, you ain't going to believe this. That crazy guy wears all them funny socks. You know what? Him and his wife all dressed up again. It's 530, and they're getting that car again. They're going over that faith thing. Now, you laugh at what I'm saying, but they're watching. And so every Sunday, Herman goes to the window. Ethel, you ain't going to believe this. Maybe you will. But that crazy guy with them thoughts and that wife of his, he must be a doctor. She's all talking about medicine, amen? <laughs> but they got in that car again, and they're going over that church. And you know, I walked in the evening, and they get in that car in the evening, and they go, they go over there on Sunday night. Now, I heard the rumor. I heard they get stuff away over there at three, and they call it safe stuff. Maybe it's green stamps. I don't know. But they're saving stuff over there. He said, Ethel, he said, next Sunday, if that guy with them crazy socks and his wife get dressed up and they're going to touch you, what we're going to do, we're going to follow right behind them. We're going to go to that faith place and we're going to get some of that faith stuff. It's free. So, week goes by. Sunday rolls around. Herman's got a suit on that doesn't fit him anymore. Ethel's got her dress on. They look out the window, and Herman goes, Ethel, Ethel, you ain't going to believe it. You ain't going to believe it. They ain't going to the church today. They got that boat hooked up behind their car. I saw that crazy guy with a flying sock. He's wearing a bikini. They're going to the lake. And then he says to his wife, I told you, Ethel, it wasn't real. We ain't going over there. We, we don't need anything. We're good. They are. They went out to the lake today. Now, you say that's a crazy story. Is it really? They're watching. They watch everybody. They watch where you live. They watch when you come to town. They watch every move that you and I make. Because you know the reason is there's some that watch and doubt. There's some that watch and criticize. But you mark this down, take it to the bank. There are those out there that are watching with hope. And they hope what we say we have is real. 
But if we don't go by the guidelines we just saw tonight in our life, you mark it down, there's going to be people who will die and burn in a lake of fire for eternity because we did not run the race. We were not ordered by the things of God. We did not persevere right down the line. It's more important today, I think, than ever before to live for Christ and not compromise a bit. Let's bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I wonder tonight if there might be just one in here. If you're not saved tonight, you never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you were to die right now tonight, you would have no